Um, I would like to welcome to the stage now Mr. Basil Makfouz, one of our SFSQ graduates. You might have recognized him from the video just a few minutes ago. Um, and he is here to introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, this is really great. Um, as an SFSQ graduate, I'm very happy to be meeting everyone from around the world. Um, this is a great opportunity for us to interact with the wider Georgetown family. Uh, before I begin to introduce the keynote speaker, I just wanted to say that we've been really overwhelmed with the support from some of the graduates here from the main campus around the GCC. And um, if any of you are interested to get more involved, feel free to get in touch with me or with the other co-president, James, sitting there at the table. So we're looking forward to meeting with any of you afterwards. Uh, the keynote speaker today is Dr. Mehran Kamrava, uh, the director for the Center of International Regional Studies at Georgetown. Um, I know him as a professor, um, an expert, renowned expert in uh, Gulf Studies, and uh, publisher of many books. And he's going to talk to you today about his most recent one, uh, Qatar, Small State, Big Politics. So please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Mehran Kamrava. Thank you, Basil. Welcome, everyone. To those of you who are new to Qatar, a warm welcome. To those of you who are my former students, my deep apologies for hearing me again. I just wanted to share with you a couple of very quick thoughts about Qatar and what's going on today in this remarkable and fascinating country. Um, I wanted to specifically uh, say a couple of things about the sources of strength uh, that Qatar has and what Qatar is trying to do in the international arena and also uh, look at Qatar's success story. Qatar is a success story. It's not an unqualified success story. There are some glitches, um, but it is nevertheless a story of a remarkable success. Over the last 20 years, in many ways, this country has accomplished things that many other countries can only dream about. And the strength and what Qatar has been able to accomplish has been facilitated by a combination of four factors, generally. First and foremost, the country has inordinate resources, particularly in relation to its population base. The total population of the country is nothing more than um, two million just slightly more than 2 million people, of whom about 200,000, 230,000 are local nationals. And what that has enabled the country to do is to have a cradle-to-grave welfare state. And so the Qatari population here is extremely well taken care of by the state because of the inordinate resources at the disposal of the state. And that inordinate wealth has also given policymakers a sense of self-confidence that they wouldn't otherwise have. And I think this sense of self-confidence has enabled the country in many ways to punch above its weight. It's a very small state, geographically and demographically, but has been able uh, uh, to do things that countries this size would ordinarily not do. But there's been a second factor that has facilitated Qatar's success story, and that has been a remarkable level of social cohesion. Unlike many of the countries in the region, particularly in the Gulf region, Qatar enjoys remarkable social cohesion that many of the other countries in the vicinity do not have. It doesn't have the confederation system of the United Arab Emirates. It doesn't have the Shia Sunni sectarian tensions that Bahrain does. It doesn't have a parliament that, like Kuwait, paralyzes the political system and the policymaking process. And it doesn't have a series of octogenarians, like in Saudi Arabia, that try to keep up with the times. And so the nature of the society has given the country a remarkable level of not just social cohesion, but political stability. And that political stability has been forged by the state's ability to bring in strategically located social actors. The buildings that we see around us, 
with Doha as a city that is rising into the sky and into the sea through the artificial um, island of the Pearl and other similar projects have facilitated the government's strategic links with a number of powerful social actors. A lot of these building projects have boards, and those boards are made up of key members of Qatari society that are in turn tied to state development projects. So unlike many of the other states in the region, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and even Kuwait, there's a remarkable degree of nexus between the state on the one hand and society on the other, therefore enabling the country to have remarkable political stability. And of course, all the wealth doesn't, doesn't hurt. There's a third factor, and that is the nature of leadership. It's a leadership that is extremely small, therefore it gives leadership tremendous agility and ability to not only capitalize on opportunities as they emerge, but to also create opportunities and to create opportunities and in turn um, uh, capitalize on them. But it also is an incredibly visionary leadership. It's a leadership that is made up of literally a handful of individuals, but also a leadership that has a very clear idea of where it wants to take Qatar in 20, 30 years. And Qatar's vision 2030, which is in many ways a guiding blueprint for the country's uh, progress over the next couple of decades, has become in many ways a mantra and a constitution for where Qatar wants to go, which is quite different, again, from if you look at some of the other regional states that have these visions but are not able in many ways to act on these visions and, um, uh, and, uh, and, and take the vision forward. Now, I should say, incidentally, that the state here, uh, the, the political system here is extremely small. The decision makers uh, in many ways can be counted on one hand. There is one decision maker that is in many ways the, um, uh, in charge of cultural activities. Uh, there is another uh, uh, individual who is in charge of uh, investments and uh, making sure that the country's uh, investments are um, robust. Uh, people in the energy field, the individual, either the Minister of Energy or whoever is responsible for energy, brings in the funds, and of course then there is the, in many ways, the chief operating officer who is the emir. And so these, these individuals are basically four or five who run the country, and not only do they run the country, but they are also able to carve out very strategic vision of where they want to take the country over the next couple of, uh, couple of decades. And this small number is, really a source of strength. It can also be a source of liability, which I'll mention in a minute, but so far at least it's been a source of strength because it's enabled the country to see opportunities as they arise, create opportunities, and in turn to capitalize um, or to, um, to zero in on them. Lastly, uh, another source of strength is what the leadership here has been able to do with its resources and with its vision. Qatar has been able to punch above its weight consistently through projection of power and through carving out influence for itself. I came here in 2007, and in 2007, up until 2007, 2008, people tend, scholars of the Middle East, tended to be very dismissive of the Gulf region because the heart of the Middle East was still considered to be places like Egypt and Damascus and Baghdad and probably Tehran and Riyadh. But, but most people were dismissive of what was happening here. And over the last decade or so, we've seen that the center of gravity has shifted away from those traditional centers of power, the Kairos and the Damascuses and the uh, Baghdads of the Middle East, onto the Abu Dhabis and the Dubais and the Dohas. And Doha is, of course, quite different because not only of its small size, but because of what it has been able to do with its vision and with its resources. And so a couple of 
key factors have enabled the country to exert an amount of influence that is by all accounts incommensurate with its size and its history. First and foremost, the country enjoys um, unparalleled U.S. protection. Uh, you know that the Gulf region, the Gulf is often referred to as the American Lake. United States military is based here, and in fact, the biggest forward U.S. base is based right here in Qatar. The United States provides a security umbrella for Qatar that in turn enables the country to engage in, instead of spending money on the military, to engage in a whole variety of international endeavors that other countries would not otherwise be able to do. Also, the country, of course, engages in a very aggressive campaign to brand itself. And that branding either takes place through Al Jazeera as the uh, showcase project for which Qatar is known the world over. Al Jazeera, let's remember, revolutionized uh, communications technology and news dissemination across the Middle East in particular, but also by engaging in showcase projects. World Cup 2020, bringing in world-class universities, having a world-class airline, and of course, uh, engaging uh, very um, effective uh, PR agencies, uh, the, the Qatar Foundation a couple of years ago uh, hired uh, the PR firm that was in charge of Apple computers. And so when you drive through Education City, you see those big letters that say think and uh, uh, discover and explore and uh, all those things. Qatar also, what sets Qatar apart in its foreign policy it's its ability to maintain open lines of communication with multiple and oftentimes very different actors. And this is what sets Qatar apart from almost every other country in the Gulf region. If you're a small state, you want protection. And many small states seek protection in the embrace, security embrace, of a potential threat. So Bahrain, for example, has sought security protection from, the, uh, from Saudi Arabia and in turn the United States. Saudi Arabia has sought protection from the United States. Kuwait, again, from the US. Qatar, of course, has American protection, but it also maintains open relations with Iran and with Hamas and with a whole variety of actors with whom the Americans don't see eye to eye. And this has been made possible through very careful positioning of Qatari diplomacy in a way that has enabled Qatar to hedge its bets with multiple, oftentimes very different actors. And what this has enabled Qatar to do is to p position itself in a way that it doesn't panic. Right now, if you look at Saudi diplomacy, it's in utter chaos. The Saudis, of course, you know, are quite nervous about um, Iran and the United States talking to each other. And Saudi nervousness all, only parallels Israeli nervousness, ironically. Qatar is quite different. Qatar, in fact, has actively not only welcomed the dialogue between the United States and Iran, but in fact, a couple of years ago, they offered to intermediate between the Iranians and the United States. Remember, Qatar's, Qatar's mediation is part of its branding strategy. So Qatar's foreign policy and its careful positioning of itself in between these very different actors, Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood on the one hand, and the United States on the other, Iran on the other, all of these have enabled Qatar to position itself in a very careful and advantageous position. Last but by no means least are Qatar's international investments. Europe's headache, Europe's uh, financial difficulties have been a source of uh, uh, opportunity for Qatar, an incredible opportunity for Qatar. My British friends don't like to hear me say that half of London nowadays is owned by Qataris, and uh, oftentimes they like to point out, my British friends, that actually it's half of Paris that own, that's owned by the Qataris. Whether it's Madrid or Paris or London, the Qataris have been able to capitalize, at least in the real estate sector, in um, in, in, in uh, Europe's economic difficulties. So Qatar has a number of strengths, and it's a success story in many ways. There are some weaknesses that I think are 
worth mentioning. Qatar has demographic limitations. 230,000 people in turn means limitations in terms of human resource capital, limitations in being able to staff the mammoth projects for which Qatar is, uh, is famous and also is aspiring to embark on uh, more and more in the coming years. So there are demographic limitations that are likely to create some um, constraints for Qatar in the coming years. There are also, there is also the negative impact of attracting attention. One thing that Qatar has been seeking to do through its branding is to put Qatar on the global map. And that has been accomplished quite successfully over the last couple of years. But with that, of course, comes some negative attention about which I'm sure we have heard in so far as migrant workers are concerned and the conditions of uh, migrant, uh, migrant labor. And interestingly, quite interestingly, for those of you who are not in the country, I think it's fair to say that the Qatari authorities have confronted the issue head on because this is not something that they can they want to simply brush under the rug and, and dismiss, but hardly a day goes by here in the country without the headline in the local paper have featuring some uh, key stakeholder from the Qatari government addressing the issue of migrant worker, and of course that has been a very positive development. But also the system is ultimately personalist. The fact that uh, this is ultimately a non-democratic political system does have limitations with it. The fact that uh, we are looking at a handful of policymakers that make key decisions naturally has some structural limitations with it, which then the country has to work with. Having said all of this, we are at a key moment of transition in Qatar. It's an exciting uh, place. This place is endlessly fascinating and ed endlessly exciting. And we're at, a, at one of those key junctures in Qatar's political history. For those of us who are students of political science, for those of us who are students of IPOL, this is an endlessly fascinating place. Transition is for now an unknown. It's only a few months old. We don't quite know if it's a transition in style or if it's a transition in substance. Well, will Qatar be in a few years? I think we're... Um, there are certain projects uh, which Qatar has embarked on from which it cannot disentangle itself even if it wanted to. Qatar is involved in a whole variety of international endeavors. It's involved in a whole variety of uh, social experiments, uh, both in terms of not just the urban landscape, but what might be called high modernism, this, this uh, futuristic city uh, in which we live. But also, it's a, definitely a change in personalities. It's a change in key decision makers, and we're seeing uh, an interesting process of transition unfold as we go through. Ultimately, this place is not only endlessly fascinating, but is bound to have a bright future. Thank you very much. Thank you.